2 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 23, that's where we'll be. 2 Samuel 23, you know, we're kind of, uh, we ramped a series up, Save Not Soft, and now we're on the, uh, we're descending now. We've got several more weeks where we'll cover this topic, and uh, before I open up another book of the Bible, um, this is just a series God kind of laid on my heart, just because Christianity has become so quiet. It's become so soft, so hoping God would use this. Um, I had an old pastor years ago, he told me, Mike, he said, here's the key, man. He said, when something's wrong in the church, when something's wrong even in the culture, he said, uh, the only thing that straightens that stuff up is the Bible. Preach the Bible. And so, and that's all I've known to do, you know, through the years um, is <clears throat> we just let God's word take care of business and clean house, you know. So that's what I'm hoping God's going to use this message today. You know, it's, every week we hear messages. It's hard sometimes. You get to the spot. Uh, you know, there was times in my life where I'd go to church and hang on every word, and there were other times in my life where I went and I couldn't wait for church to end, you know. And I'd venture to say most of those wasn't probably the church I went to or the guy up front. Most of that was probably this heart of mine that tends to just go up and down through life, you know. So that's just the way it is. If you want the theme of today's message, if you'd like to take a nap, um, then just write this down. The theme of this message today, I know we're calling it Saved Not Soft, but I'm actually gonna focus on the word honor. It's a lost word in our culture. Um, people bringing honor, um, even in our parenting, we like to quote verses on children, obey your parents and the Lord, but we never want to take it to the next verse that says, honor thy father and mother, what it means to really bring honor to them. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. It's just honor, how it's missing. We need to make sure it's uh, in place, right? And we're going to see it from a beautiful story in 2 Samuel chapter 23. We've actually been looking at a lot of David's mighty men of valor uh, through this. These guys were just, I mean, these guys were tough individuals that in, in a world, and they were not afraid to go against. They never were afraid to take risks. And I think that's what's missing from our Christianity, that God would speak to us and we would actually obey his voice. We would actually step out there no matter what people think. That's a big problem, isn't it? We just care a little bit much, I think, what other people feel or what other people think. It says in second, second Samuel 23, starting in verse 13, it says, three of the 30 chief went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave of Dulam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. Verse 14, and David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. So here David is. They're near the, this cave of Adullam. It says the Philistines pitched in the valley over here, and they had, the Philistines had a garrison, you know, they were, it's their battle stand was right here. And it says in verse 14, David was then in a hold. David and his mighty men were just in a position of like, just what it means, hold, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? We're kind of in a pinch. So they're under pressure, under pressure. And then verse 15 says, and David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of, of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it thereof, but he poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. Jesus, uh, take your words today, lift them off this page, and drill them deep into our souls, into our hearts. Uh, Lord, we need it. Lord, we see that our culture needs it. And God, honestly, today, I need it. I, I need more of this in my world and in my life. So teach us today. May it be profitable for old, for young. Do your work, Holy Spirit of God. Speak to us all um, where we need it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here David is in a tight spot. The Philistines are around him, and it just says David speaks up, and he longed, man. It says he longed for uh, this drink of water. 
Um, he said in verse 15, Oh, that woman, give me drink the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Not only was it a well in Bethlehem where it happened that the Philistines were, it says this well was even by the gate. It's not like it was on the backside. You could sneak back there and get through there and get some. Oh, no, it was right where you enter in. It was right there in the middle of everything at the opening of this place. And these three mighty men, it says in verse 16, they break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate. What's beautiful, just I'll give you some tidbits on this story and then I'm gonna get back to um, what I think God wants us to hear today out of this story. Um, What's crazy about this is, you know, David is from Bethlehem. David knows what this water tastes like. And Jesus, of course, was born in Bethlehem. And it also is called the city of David in Luke 2, 4. That's what Bethlehem is called, the city of David. John seven forty two said Christ came from the seed of David. So there's no doubt about in this story, anybody that would read this story and start to study your Bible, everybody I think realizes that David is a picture of Jesus Christ in the Bible. His name means beloved. That's what name David means. And of course, Jesus Christ was the only beloved son of God. Um, he is ends up being the king in Israel, the, one of the greatest Israel ever had, but he's a king that represents the king, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's just a beautiful type when he takes his role as king over Israel. The Messiah is frequently called the son of David, and this basically is in several New Testament passages. And so uh, there's several things in his life. Now, we, we like would remember the story of David and Goliath, right? First Samuel 17, the battle was with Goliath, but David fought <clears throat> for Israel. He fought on Israel's behalf. You know, Romans 5, 19 says that Jesus came to planet Earth and fought a battle on our behalf, just like David did, right? Um, David is Israel's only representative against the enemy in 1 Samuel 17, 8 through 11. The only representative, and it's the same for you and me, um, our only representative against the enemy that we face, Romans 5, 18 through 19, it says is the Lord Jesus Christ. David just frequently pictures Jesus for you and me, right? Um, David was sent by his father, remember, to see how the battle was progressing. I want you to go and check on and to see how the battle was progressing. Well, 1 John four fourteen says that Jesus Christ was also sent by the father to planet earth. There's just so many beautiful things. You guys remember David gets there. David's rejected by his brothers. His brothers rejected him. Jesus. Jesus came to planet earth and his own received him not. John 7 verse 5. You know, David constantly was learning from his trials and experiences he faced. And Jesus Christ, Hebrews 5, 8 says, and he learned by the things that he suffered. Same thing, right? So David's victory was always Israel's victory. Romans 5, 19, Christ's victory is our victory. So everything we read about David, you'll just see, I mean, even David handing out rewards to his people. You're like, oh my gosh, that's gonna happen one day in Revelation 22, 12. The Bible says Jesus is gonna do this for you and me. And so we see over and over again, you can't deny that David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's really beautiful. So the key, one key for you and me here is Bethlehem. Uh, You know, the other one's gonna be not just the city of David, but there's a well there. And guys, um, we know clearly David just longed for a drink of this water. And guys, I think this was more than I'm parched. My mouth's dry. I could really use a drink of water. I don't know what if if there was water where he was at or what kind of water it was, this water from the well of Bethlehem is different. We know when Jesus was faced with a woman at the well and she said, uh, he said, can you give me a drink? You know, he's dealing with this lady and then he tells her that, hey, how about I give you a drink? We start learning in that story that Jesus Christ is the water. He is the deep well and he says, I will give you water and you'll never thirst again. It's a beautiful story that we all love to hear that story. And uh, so here David, I think he longs for this water, not because he's so maybe parched, but maybe because he's from there. And now he's on the run. He's in a tight spot. The Bible says he's in this holding pattern. The enemy's all around. He's like, man, just for a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. 
you know, there's something about that. And, and I don't know about you, but this is the beautiful part for you and me. Um, uh, I'm just throwing out some practical things before I get to that. I got like some points today. <laughs> but basically for you and me, um, when you're in a hold, when the pressures of life have got you, you feel like the enemy surrounding you, you're just in this holding pattern. And sometimes you just long, you remember back of the sweet fellowship you had with Christ when there was just utter peace in your life. And hey, don't chalk it up to saying, I was just naive back then. No, that was just some good water from a deep well. And that's why every morning I think me and you all desire to get in God's word, right? In the midst of all life is giving us, sometimes you just like waking up in the morning and say, God, I just need a drink from the well. I'm in a hold, man. I'm, I'm tired of waiting just to drink a water. And, you know, the Bible says this for you and me, that we have a responsibility like Jesus in a world that's parched, in a world that's dying, and they're dying of thirst. We get a great opportunity of introducing people to Jesus. He is the well of water. He is the one that grants eternal life, right? Right? So it's our job to constantly give good news to thirsty and starving people. Don't ever lose sight of that. That's our job. Sometimes when my life's tough, I'm thinking around, my gosh, I have tasted and drank deeply. There's other people that haven't even had this opportunity. You ever wonder why God says in Galatians 6, 9, says, hey, don't forget this, church. Hey, don't get weary in well-doing. Not just doing well. Oh, I'm doing good. Thank you. Don't ever get weary of taking well water to people that long for it. Don't be weary in well doing. He says it second time in, in Thessalonians 3.13. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, be not weary in well doing. Church, let's be about the busy of well doing. Let's take this well water to other people. You know, honestly, in 1 Peter 3, 17, another verse, it just says that, hey, he, he's basically talking about you that suffer. He goes, the great part for you that suffer, you, you that suffer for well-doing. You're, you're not suffering for stupid doing. You're not suffering because of poor decisions in your life. Some people do. But he says the real suffering that you can bear and that is actually a badge of honor is when you suffer for well-doing. When your life suffers because you're doing everything you can to get water to thirsty people and you suffer, that's a badge of honor, my friend. Let's suffer for well-doing. Let's stop suffering for ridiculousness. We suffer and put our things through, we put ourselves through the hardest, most difficult things. Just for good doing, mm, don't, don't settle for good doing well doing. Get after the well. So just a practical application here is get the water to those that long for it, right? Um, that's just practical. And some people say, I'm not sure I see that in the context. Okay, that's fine. You ready to move on with the story? It says this, these men broke through the lines of the Philistines. They dipped in that well and got a, a, a container of water and took it back to David. This phrase to break through, I want you to know this. This is not one of those deals where Israel sneaks in the camp, Saul is sleeping, and like the God of heaven puts everybody in this deep sleep so they're not awake. They're sneaking through all these people. And so incredibly quietly, you know, and David, you know, Saul's going to the bathroom and David cuts a chunk of his britches off just later just to say, could have killed you. And of course, remember when David's heart smote him and all. This ain't one of those stories. If you study this phrase, they break through the lines of the Philistines. This is a violent act. To break through would be to split open. The word cleave or, or tear, that's another word it's translated in the Bible, is to, to tear. Um, when Moses in Exodus 14, 16, he raised up his rod and he said, and you know what it did? It broke through the Red Sea. It divided it like a sword would. This rod divided the sea. So that word, in 1 Kings, there happened to be an earthquake, but it used the phrase, instead of earthquaking, it says the earth rent. 
That word rent, like renting a garment, that's the same word used uh, here in this context where it says um, they break through the line of the Philistines. This, they broke the thing up is what they did. It's the picture of the bottles in the New Testament that if you put new wine in old bottles, it'll break them open or it uses the word burst. It'll burst. In Isaiah 34, the same word is an owl hatching eggs. And that's what it uses the word, a great owl will make a nest and then hatch. You know what that is? That's a violent act. And I know ladies giving birth is a very violent act. I've been there for a couple of them. But this is, you talk, these little birds gotta get out and what do they gotta do? They gotta fight. There's a hard crust that they've gotta break through. And that's exactly what we find here. It's the same word in Hosea says that beast will come and it'll tear you up. That's the phrase it uses. So I guess I want everybody to know this. As we read this story, these guys, as they came through, they went to get this well of water, these three men. I'll tell you what they did. They killed some folks along the way. I believe that's wholeheartedly what happened here. I think it was a violent act as they broke through. Basically, what I'm trying to say is these guys risked their lives to get David some water from that well at Bethlehem. And I would say, what are we willing to risk our lives for? Maybe I should say this a little bit differently. Who would we risk our lives for? Okay, we're gonna talk about honor. That's what I, I see in this passage and I just could never get away from it. So I thought, God, I'm gonna go to your word and I have gotta study what honor is, what it really means to do this. We don't find this in our culture um, much. You know, if you watch like The Last Samurai with like... Um, um, Tom Cruise in it, that movie, he ends up going over to Japan, he ends up being held captive, ends up in a village of people that are, I mean, some serious samurai trained soldiers. He literally enters into a culture of nothing but honor and respect, and it starts really affecting his life. And you can see it in things like that in other places, but in our culture, you don't find this very often. Um, we talk more negative, actually, about our leaders and people in authority than we do anything else. These guys here, man, heard David longing for this, and they're just like, let's get it. Let's get it for him. And so they break through, risking their lives, and come back. And of course, David is so blown away that he pours this as an offering to the Lord. He says, the blood of these men are at stake here, which goes to show you this. These three men honored their king. They wanted to honor their leader. But their leader was so humble, he gave that honor to the Lord. That's what's happening in this story, essentially. And that's what good leaders do, right? Is they give the honor to whom that honor is due. Let's talk a little bit about honor today. Um, you know, honor, you can come up with a lot of words for it if you want, but we're gonna see characteristics of it in the Bible. But honor sometimes is with the word glory. You'll find honor with the word splendor or with the word majesty in, in the Bible, especially dealing with like kings. Honor's kind of a heavy word. It's a word where you would say, <clears throat> It's like a contractor giving an estimate. The hardest part about being in business for yourself is the estimate. And what you always do to get jobs and to be busy, the curse of every young guy out there, myself included, you just proud to do jobs, man. You start bidding work and you get it. And it took me a long time to realize that, man, I got that because I lost my shorts. It wasn't heavy enough. And now the best thing you could do is when somebody gets your estimates, they're like, ooh, I didn't think it'd be this high. Yeah, I thought about making it higher, honestly. Because I value my work that much. I'm, I'm gonna leave you guys with a great product. That's why. And uh, so an estimate, or here's the, my, my, favorite, my favorite word for honor is 
It's when you fix a value on something. Honor is when you fix a very high value. These three men in this story, they valued David. When they had nobody else, David stood up. When they were running into rebellion, David stood up, and he goes out in the forest and says, all who want to come, follow me. All the broken can come here. We're not tolerant. He's the Robin Hood in the story, right? And all these people followed him. These guys had no real purpose in life. And they're like, you know what? Let's risk it for our king, for our leader, David. Let's go get him some water out of that well. They just wanted to honor him. You know why? Because he meant so much to them. It's a beautiful story. This is what honor is. When you fix a value to something. That's why all through Proverbs it says, don't honor a fool. It's not seemly for a fool to get honor, right? It's hard when somebody, guys, we've all had people that we've known that have been put in a position that they do not belong. It's hard to honor them, isn't it? Because you sit back and you're like, boy, that's, she's a fool. He's a fool. The Bible says a man that will cease from strife, there's some honor to him. We'll fix the high value to that guy. But you know what fools do? The same verse said fools, that's all they do is stir it up, man. That's what they do. So honor is not made for a fool. I want to give you a list of people that the Bible says honor is for. Are you ready? And I'll start off and it'll start small and it's going to get big. When I say it starts small, I'm not meaning it's less important. I'm just saying that's just the beginning point. The first one would be what? Everybody knows this one. What would it be? What I said at the beginning. Children. Children. Obey your parents, or, or then it also says, make sure that you, uh, Ephesians 6, 1 says obey them. Ephesians 6, 2 says, honor your mom and dad. It's true. All through the Bible, it starts clear back in Exodus 20. They're putting together pieces of the law, and it says, okay, children, obey your parents. You better bring them honor. This is hard for you and me, because some of us grew up in homes where you're like, my gosh, my dad wasn't honorable. He bailed. He left. I don't know him. You know what my mom did? You know, we got all these stories and craziness that happened, and it's hard. And you know what the Bible still says? It, it never says, hey, make sure you obey your parents when. Hey, only give your parents honor if. It don't say that stuff. It says obey. It says honor them. No parent's perfect, are they? No parent's perfect. Um, if there is, I'm moving in your house, man. There's no perfect parents out there, but the Bible says they still should have get our obedience, and the hard part is honor, especially if. Guys, I watched a girl. Oh, I could tell you a great story. I got to be part of a young girl that was abused by her dad in every way imaginable, man. Like, it's unbelievable. And I got to be part of the process of this girl going to her dad and just saying, I know I haven't talked to you for years. You're my father. And I just want to say today that I love you and I'm extending forgiveness to you and it wasn't even asked for. I thought, what honor. Well, he was dead wrong. You know, I always thought, his head needs put between two rocks. That's what I always thought. And she goes, and I was like, wow, unbelievable. Because I know a lot of people say, I'm not going to honor my mom and dad because they don't deserve it. Boy, watch that. You're on a very slippery slope there. And the Bible says you'll live long on the earth. It's the first commandment with promise. So father and mother. So everybody, our fathers and mothers should be honored. So mom and dads, teach this. Don't go, when people come to your house to visit and uh, they walk in the room, you know, um, like I, I've watched kids plop right down in the best seat in the house, plop down on the couch. You ever see somebody a little bit older, like get on the floor because there's no seats and there's a bunch of people in the house? I see it all the time because we get together for tribes and stuff. It's your job as a parent to say, son, hey, sweetie, give that up for somebody older. You're just teaching honor. You know, that's what parents do. We teach honor. We, we teach that to, you know, to, whether it's to their mom or to me. You know, we get involved in that and want to teach it. So, hey, I'm going to give details how to do this. But so the first, we learn it at home. You got to learn this. And guys, it's not being taught in homes today. So that's why you end up coaching a team and you're like, I can't believe that girl just did that to me. I was at a baseball game coaching one time and just little girls. And uh, I remember I was yelling at this girl catching. And because she was doing the same thing over and over again, I finally was just like, hey, you know, get your head. I, it wasn't that bad. But I was like, listen to me. And she took off her helmet and in front of everybody, she rolled her eyes and then walked back behind. 
I lost my mind in front of everybody. I screamed for the whole world to hear. I wanted the whole world to hear. I said, whoa, time out. I said, you never roll your eyes at your coach. You never turn your head like that. And the bad part is when I got done, would you do that at home? I'm letting her have it. Now, everybody's hearing me because I want it to be a good example to everybody. And it just didn't dawn on me until I was halfway in this fight that uh, the assistant coach with me was her dad. Uh, you know. But you know, I went back and he goes, and she needed that. She needs it at home. Help her with that. And uh, we all need help with that, right? So anyways, fathers and mothers. The next one would go right in. It's still family. Wives and husbands. This one could hurt a little bit. First Peter 3, 7 says we should give honor unto our wives. Honor our wives. It's our, you know what? Fix a high value there. That's what you do. And it's sad to me the way people live their lives and their but to give them honor, like, you know, to treat her like, you know, she is the queen of the home. It's true. Majesty, lay it heavy, fix a high value on mama, on your wife. Um, our culture lacks this today. Everybody wants to sit around and we always talk, you know, and bad about each other. It's not supposed to be that way. The Bible says marriage is honorable. You know what that means? That's Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable, meaning that it's, it's heavy. It's a, there's a great, marriage is precious, man. It's precious. Treat it like that. And uh, that's why Ephesians 5, says, hey, wives, submit yourselves, therefore, to your own husbands. What is that all about? You know what that is? It's honor. It's respect and honor. It just uses the word to get right down to it then. It's to submit, to put yourself under. I know people don't like that, especially women. I'd have a hard time liking that too at times. I've been in this position before, not just um, in this scenario, right? So it says that wives submit yourselves to your own husbands. What that is is you're giving him honor. Even if you disagree with maybe one of the decisions, you have every right in the world as a couple to discuss that and do it. But when it's over, to sit down and put your feet down and say you're not for it, the Bible would say, will you not honor him? You don't, and honoring him is not saying, yes, we'll do it, and then telling all your girlfriends that you disagree. That is not honor. That's obedience. To obey, take it a step further in your heart and in your mind and really bring honor. And you know what I've learned too? When my wife honors me, like she fixes a value and maybe higher than I even think I belong to, I want to live up to that. You ever do that? I want to live up to it, man. Because you know, she said so many nice things about me. That was, she did that back in like eight, 1991, I think. But Hey, 1 Corinthians 7 says, husband and wife give each other due benevolence. That's due love. Notice it uses the word due. I like that. It's due. It's due her. Honor her. Respect her. Honor him. Respect him. How do we do that? Let me riddle off a bunch of practical ways this can happen. What about when he's talking? Don't interrupt. It's that simple, and it's that difficult. You know a way you can honor your wife? Smile at her. She'll say, what are you laughing at? You? It's just funny. I, I like when you do that, actually. And uh, My wife is the best. I like when she, when she laughs. We all say that at the home. When she starts getting giddy and laughing late at night, we just think it's the best, you know? And I want to give her honor. Talk positive to other people about your spouse. Welcome them home. You know what welcoming them home is? Dad's home or mom's home, and we stop everything. Or you're watching something, then you hit pause. You're cooking something, then put it off to the side. You know what that is? That's, it's, just, it's a simple way to honor. I got things to do. Nobody's stopping for anybody. If you really want to honor your husband, stop. You know, as the years go on, it's funny, uh, you know, because I got 10 years between my girls. So my wife used to say, hey, man, 
<laughs> dad's home. You know, and, and it was awesome. We'd kiss and hug at the door. Then you have your first child, and mama goes, your dad's home. I heard his car pull up. And then she get fired up and want to come and get me. And then as she gets older, that loses its luster. And then we, we had the youngest. And then it was like, hey, dad's home. So who would be the one meet me outside? It was my youngest, you know. And now my, they let the dog out. <laughs> but he's incredibly happy to see me. No joke. He loves me, man. And, I, and I'm just like, yeah. He'll do zoomies right in the driveway. And I'm, then I start doing them like, yeah, you know, my dog, you know. It's honor. Hey, be happy, man. Be positive. Talk great in front of your kids about your husband, about your wife. Hey, and here's another one, gang. Hey, work. Work to be in shape. Now, don't, don't run extreme with that. I'm not saying we all need to look like that. But work to be attractive. Maybe that'd be a good, that, that, uh, to honor. I'm going to bring him honor. I'm going to bring her honor. You know, if you walk out and, you know, I'm greeted by like, are you wearing that out? That's a good sign for me. Well, instead of getting mad, I, I want to bring her honor. Was well, something wrong with this? You know, and, and, some, and I have a thing where I'm, I make my own fashion, you know, so I'll mix that. And my girls used to say, you know why you like that? You like it because it, you don't like it because it matches. Because I'm going to say, everybody else matches. I'm going to be a little bit different there. I don't like articles of clothing that have somebody else's name on them. I've never liked that. It drives me insane. And so, like, I've, do you guys remember when, like, Old Navy came out and they had all the Old Navy T-shirts? Man, they were so cheap, everybody had them. And somebody got me one for a birthday thing, and I used it to paint in. I just didn't want to wear that out. I'm like, man, they can pay me to wear the shirt, you know? I, I just don't care for that. But let's make sure we work to be attractive. Um, what about time together without the kids? Honor your husband so much. If your love to your spouse is because of your kids, you're, you're messed up there. They can be a great part of it. They are a great part of it. But you make sure you have time for your spouse without your children. You know what that's called? Anna. Your kids better know that you honor him more than them. Or vice versa. My wife needs to know that she is the one. I fix a high value on her. They're going to move out and probably get married to somebody someday, the love of their life. I got the love of my life. Just honor her. Just treat her that way, right? Don't talk down to them. Hey, what about cleaning? Husbands and wives, areas that drive them nuts or her nuts or him nuts, whatever. Yeah. Don't undermine their authority. All those things, man. You know, it's just, it's simple. It's pretty simple, you know, to to say, hey, man, does this look okay? And literally listen. That's, that's so simple to honor, but yeah. So fathers and mothers, wives and husbands, let's bring back some honor, man. And these are easy things. We're not talking about David. And David's mighty men are just like, we honor David and love our leader so much. We might die doing this, but what a great story is going to be written about us. They were after it. They wanted them, the world to know that David meant that much to them that they would might maybe have to give up their life. Here's another one in the Bible. We got what? We covered parents. We covered uh, relationships, husbands and wives. Okay, older men or elders. That's another one the Bible says. The hoary head, the gray head is a crown of glory. We should always teach our children to, um, to respect elders. Uh, it's gone today, but the Bible says that bring them honor. That's grandfather. That's, a, that's the patriarch of the family. You know, hey, kiss your grandpa, kiss your grandma. You know, hold the door for them. Help her out, you know. And we got the opportunity to do that the other day. There was an old lady that was really struggling at the store, and my whole family got to get involved with us, getting this lady where she needed to be. It was, she was in bad, bad shape. And, you know, we just said, we're, we're going to honor this lady. And she trusted me with her keys, man. She gave me her keys to her car. I took her across and said, ma'am, you need some help here, man, and we're going to get that done for you. But what, what we were really doing is just saying, we honor you. You've lived life, and you have kids, and they've moved away, and now she was all alone, and she needed help. Honor the face of the old man, Leviticus 19, and verse 32 says, honor the face of the old man. And guys, um, you know, and I don't care where you're at, um, even uh, we were in the jail um, a couple weeks ago, and there's an older man. He's, uh, you know, uh, probably p pushing, I don't know, maybe 70, and he got into some trouble, and they put him in a cell with everybody that's like 18 and 19, and these dudes stay up till the wee hours of the morning. 
And this old guy's in You know what I love seeing? We start asking him questions. This old guy cries. The young guys don't know what to do. And they were like walking over and they're like, hey, pops, uh, hey, grandpa, it'll be all right. I could tell it. And I was just like, that's right. Take care of that guy. Take care of that guy. It was, it was beautiful to watch. So older people honor widows that are widows indeed, for sure. Now, that, that topic is godly widows, I know, but we, we bring them honor. It don't mean that we're, you know, if they got family, I know we're not responsible as a church to support the, you can read that for yourself. Honor, here's another one. Catch this one, are you guys ready? Honor your boss. Honor your boss. First Timothy 6, 1, servants, count your masters worthy of honor. Your boss your managers, those who are directly over you. How do you bring them honor? Anybody know how to do that? How do you bring your boss honor? You know the best way, do your best work for her, for him. Do your best. Their name's going on it most likely. You make them shine. What about a meal? Share a meal together. You just say, hey man, you've been good to me. I wanna take you to lunch one day. Pick the day, I'm buying. What about a handwritten note? Somebody would say, on the construction site, guys are going to think like that you're, you know, that's weird. Yeah, make them think it then. Right? Who cares what they say? Your boss gets a little note on the way home, just say, and it don't have to be long, and don't, don't, don't write a poem. That would be weird. <laughs> but just say, hey, dude, I've worked many a sites before, and I just want you to know, full respect for you. The other day when you told me your story, <laughs> I think it's pretty incredible that you're still with your wife and your kids and you're fighting through this. Lots of respect for you, man. And then I put X's and O's. Don't do that. Don't do that. Buy gifts. I mean, little thing. Guys, it's simple. It's simple. It's their birthday or there's a holiday. You know, you do something. You can decorate things. You do some Make it up as you go. I don't know. Find out what they like. What means a lot to him or to her. You'll find out like, you know, Maybe he's a dude that likes plants, like he does a lot of gardening, and you found something unique. Maybe she loves flowers, and, you know, be careful, you know, don't get, get like a dozen roses. That might be a little bit weird when your wife's home, like, you did what? To your boss? Yeah, okay. I gave her six, and I brought you the other six, you know. They wilted in the car all day, but that's all right. Here they are, right? So your boss, how do you talk about your boss? to other people. Um, let me give you the next one, and this is probably the one you find most in Scripture, the king, when there's a king. Now, our culture don't have a king, um, but we do have uh, you know, a system of government officials, and so I think the Bible's very clear about this. When there's rulers in place, it's our job to honor them. Guys, you can vote against them. You don't have to agree with every policy. But see, we tend to take it past a policy, and we start beating up the person, I know a lot of people are struggling with our president right now. And yet the Bible clearly says we are supposed to pray for those in authority. Who's praying? Or he gets up, you know, I, I post seven memes about him falling off of a bike. Guys, our president's an older man. And in public he falls off of a bike. Isn't that, I don't know, I just want to slap somebody's children. Why in God's name, that's not funny. And people, I know what they're doing. I know what people are doing. They're making a, more of a political statement saying he can't be president and he shouldn't be. Well, that's fine, but is now the time to do it? And if you have no influence, why do you decide to do that? I'm just gonna smear his name all over the place. You don't have to agree with the policy. I'm just saying, but you do have to honor. And I'll tell you right now, if he walked right in that back door, I would shut everything down. Say, let's all stand to our feet, because here's the president of the United States. Somebody would say, yeah, but he's corrupt. Do you know he did this? Do you know his money's over here? Do you know his son over here? I know all that. And I, st I wouldn't want his job, would you? Guy's got a heavy load on his plate. It's all, we know politics. <laughs> the king, honor the king. We don't worship him. We honor, we just place a high value um, we estimate that, man, that thing is, it's, it's valuable. So that's the biggest one in the Bible, by the way, is kings and those in authority. Now, here's another one that enters. This is weird for me because this is my territory. The Bible says we should um, honor our spiritual leaders or, or elders. 
not just aged with gray hair, but aged in their walk with the Lord. Um, the Bible says, him that worketh good, make sure you honor in Romans 2.10. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, elders that rule well, you give them double honor. Now listen, folks, we know that we honor the Lord with our substance, so I want you to know something here. You know what this is? Honor your spiritual leaders with your stuff. It's true. It's true. And like me, I feel like, man, my gosh, there's people that give their hard-earned money. And you know, that comes to me. That's unbelievable. When I first got a paycheck at this church, I remember there was a few times, man, it tore me up. Because I was like, God, I'm doing this for you, for rewards in heaven. And it don't feel right getting money from people to do this. I feel like now my motive's in question. It was hard for me. I had to grow through that. In reality, it was something the Bible set up in place. It's fine. That's how it's set up. Paul even teaches that. And so I was like, okay, Lord, I just need to be careful with it. By the way, that same passage in 1 Timothy 5, 19 says there should be no accusation unless there's two or three witnesses against um, a man of God. So two things it mentions there. How do you honor your spiritual leaders? Well, one, with your stuff, your substance. That's how you honor the Lord, right? We give him the first fruits. It's uh, the similar principle here in 1 Timothy 5. And the next thing you do is you honor him with your mouth. Now, it's more than your mouth, but most people dishonor people in leadership because they're always second-guessing, questioning, and talking. And a lot of times what people do is they go around their husband and go to the Lord. And they dishonor their husband and go right to the Lord. They dishonor their parents. And they go right to the Lord because he's the one I'm going to honor. They dishonor their boss. and they, go, they dishonor the king and those in public. They dishonor the pastor and say, I got a relationship with the Lord and I know what the Bible says. You have just dishonored the Lord. Because he told us to honor our parents. He told us to honor our fathers and mothers, our wives, our husbands, our elderly people, our boss, the kings, and then spiritual leaders. Obey them that watch over your souls. And people would say, I do not have, and guys, I'm telling you, it's the curse of the age we live in. There's a curse that we all live under and live in. And that is, when you have somebody in your life, like you got to have people in your life that are deeply connected that can even like offer a change or a, a rebuke. They can offer those things. We will avoid people like that. So I want you to know something. It says here that we, ought, we can honor our spiritual leaders. It says with our stuff. And by the way, praise the Lord. I'm privileged you guys do that. It's an honor. And it's a humbling. It's weird. Because I'm, I'm supposed to serve you. Sometimes I fail at that, you know. It's a weird thing. But then also with your mouth. All the things that you can do to bring people honor, a lot of it, you know what it translates to? The one that we all want to honor most and biggest and foremost is the Lord, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Hey, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. See, the way you're going to honor the Lord is you're going to honor this man or this woman. The Bible says that, and it always says, like to the Lord, well, how if he's a jerk? How if she's a, a, an idiot, you know? And Lord says, well, then you do it for me. You do it for me. That's because you want to honor me so much. Glory and honor, all glory and honor belong to the Lord this morning. All. All honor and majesty go to him. The Bible says we will, Psalm 66, 2, we will sing forth the honor of his name. That's what we do. We can't hold it in. It's a song and we will sing it out, right? My mouth is filled with praise and honor, Psalm 71 and verse 8, to the Lord. I am going to make it known publicly that he is my God and I am going to bring him honor. You know how we do that? Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits. One of the ways we honor the Lord is when we get anything, first we give to him. It's yours, Lord. You've given me this job. You've given me these things, you've given me these items, and I want to bless you. So we, with our stuff, with our substance, and then the second one is, guess what? 
We sing forth his praise. My mouth is filled with his glory and honor, our mouth. Isn't it funny? The same two things. What you doing with your stuff and what are you doing with your mouth? Because it is the proof of what you honor. If you talk about a certain subject all of the time, you're giving more honor to that subject. Your, its value is a little bit higher than anything else. And what we should be is we should make sure that we are giving the Lord all of our thoughts, man, all of our stuff, all of our, what comes out of our mouth. So guys, honor, we fix such a high value to all of our stuff. You know, and I don't know what kind of dad you are or what kind of husband, but it's kind of like, you know, there's one left. Everybody's had it, but there's one left. And you hungry. What do you do with it? And your kids are saying, hey, dad, can I have that? What, 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 you got a decision to make at that point. Do you value your belly more than you value your child? And you know what I love? This is no lie. All through my whole life as my girls have been growing up, I would literally be watching Monday Night Football and one of my girls would come in and just say, do we have to watch this? Like, no, you can go anywhere you want to. I'm watching it here. That's not what happens. I'll say, uh, no, we don't have to watch it, especially if it's a game of two teams that don't matter. I have nobody in my fantasy league playing tonight. What am I watching this for? I don't need to watch it, but I like to watch it. And uh, I'll say, seriously, you can watch what you want, and, and, and you can testify this. Ask my girls this. And my wife will see this transpire take place. She'll walk in the room and say, stop it. Your dad never demands the TV, never watches anything. Sundays, half the time he's busy, he misses a lot of football. Mondays and Thursdays, he can catch a little bit. And so what? Give the remote to your dad. And you know what all my wife is doing at that point? She's enjoying time away from me. That's what, that's what really has happened. No, what she's doing is just saying, we want to honor this man. Guys, it feels really weird, man, but I'm just like, what a good woman, you know? Wow, that is honor. And, uh, and I'm, I hope the point of that story was not that my kids are brats. The point of that story is, boy, my wife really knows how to dish out honor, and that's really important. And I am really running out of time right now. Um, and it's okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump on this subject next week, if that's okay with everybody. I just feel like it needs a little bit of our time because now there's character traits in the Bible, and I've got five of them I found consistently in Scripture, how we can do this. What are the characteristics and the real traits of honor? Maybe you can look up honor in, in the Bible this week and do your own study. But I'm here to tell you, today we at least got through this. David and his men, they risked their lives to bring their leader honor. Super special story. And David honored the Lord and poured it out. I am not worthy of this. These guys risked their lives. The Lord, I'm giving it to the Lord. You know, these three guys didn't get mad either. You know, what I, you know what they were doing? I guarantee what they were doing. They presented this to the leader of their king. And when he said, I can't do this, I poured it out. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their leader. The Lord's worthy of this offering. It's his. It's his. So you ready? Let's deal with it. Everybody, anything you heard today that God spoke to your heart, you was like, I struggle with this. How's your relationship with your mom and dad? Some of you don't have your parents now, and I bet you'd think differently, wouldn't you? How'd you do for Father's Day last week to your dad? You gotta think of those things, man. Are you bringing him honor? How about your wife? Men, do you honor your wife? Honoring your wife is not letting her do whatever she wants to do. Honoring your husband is not allowing him to do whatever he wants to do. That's not it. Are you bringing them real honor? And we, I gave you some practical things you can do. What about older people? If you've got grandparents, maybe you have neighbors that are a little bit older. Um, are you bringing them honor? Do you teach your kids to hold doors open and do things like that? Very, very important. Um, what about your boss? your manager or your boss at work, do you bring them honor or are you constantly talking about how bad they suck? That's not bringing them honor. And remember, the mouth is important. Now listen, I'm not saying you greet everything they do. We talked about that, president and policy, right? Can't stand that policy. I'm not saying I hate that guy. And guys, in behind the scenes, somebody's put money in his pocket saying pick this policy. You know how that works, right? So we gotta have a little compassion. Be like, my gosh, you know. 
I'm just like, you know, what are you? I don't know, whichever pocket's the heaviest. I'm like, oh, there's more cash in that pocket. This is what I am, you know. Um, what about your boss or the king? Those in authority, let's be careful of, uh, and by the way, as messed up as our world is and as chaotic as it is and so many different opinions and so many things going, uh, just crazy out there, um, let's just stop today and say, God, thank you for the United States of America. It's been a great place to be. Other countries respect the United, there's a lot of things we don't, they don't respect about, but there's things as a whole, they look at the way we've done our nation. It's a great place to live. If you don't think so, then just go visit Palestine. Go, go, go live in Pakistan for a couple weeks and see how you vacation well there. Seriously, go to Baghdad. What are you doing here? Just wanted to bring my family for vacation. Are you serious, dude? You better vacation at the airport. Catch the next flight out. Um, elders, spiritual elders, spiritual leaders, pastors, maybe people that discipled you, Sunday school teachers, all of those things, spiritual leaders, the Bible. There's a pretty good list in the New Testament of bringing honor to those folks. And then ultimately, and we all know it was leading to this, it was the Lord. So King David, well, not quite king yet, but they honored him with their lives, risking their lives. And he poured it out before the Lord because that's how much the Lord, and he wanted that water. He wanted it. He remembers how good it tasted and how incredible. Now these men risk their lives when he's like, you know what, nobody deserves a sacrifice like this except the real king, right? The king of the universe, the Lord of lords. So um, that's it. Apply it. Let's all do something with it. Whatever got in next week, show up, and you know what we're going to talk about? Five practical things. And if you're... Um, you might, might want to invite people next week for that. You're like, hey, invite some coworkers. That'd be a good thing. Hey, you need to come next week and hear what the Bible says about it. We need to, uh, let's lift this. That's what Christians do, don't we? We lift these things up. We make them higher. We don't provoke and stir our kids up to wrath, but we build them up. We lift them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So that's what this is going to be. We're going to lift this principle up because the Bible teaches it. Jesus, thank you for your word today. Lord, I'm thankful for all of our Sunday school teachers next door that are investing in our children and teaching. And God, I pray that all of our children today, that they had not just fun, but the lights are coming on inside of their head as they're learning things and hearing stories, that they're drawn to you. So thank you for the people that prepared and invested. Lord, I thank you for the Maple City Baptist Church. God, it's been good on this series, Save Not Soft, God, because we don't want to be just marshmallows. We really want to honor you. And we know by honoring you, we're going to do that with our substance and we're going to do it with our mouths. And so this principle of honor, God, I pray that we would get it right. I pray this week that there'd be some apologies made, that people would ask some forgiveness to some spouses and to parents and to maybe our employer, um, all of those things, God. May we get this right today. So thanks, Lord, for teaching us, loving us enough that you speak where we live into our world, into our culture. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.